Texas C-SPAN 2. Today, the group Aviation Week hosted a discussion on the U.S. space program. Coming up, their look at the history and future of the program with comments by former astronaut Buzz Aldrin. After that, another chance to hear from U.N. Secretary General Kofi Annan. And about 3 a.m. Eastern, NRA Executive Vice President Wayne LaPierre from our Washington Journal program. Now, that look at the U.S. space program. All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. And I'm assuming those of you still getting coffee or whatever can find your way to your seat, okay? Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being here. Good morning. I know it's awfully early for uh, some of you. Some people actually get to work this early in the morning. I'm not one of those, but uh, glad you could join us uh, here. Today is the first day of the second century of flight, as we all know. And this is the next century of flight, Space Imperatives Conference. Welcome. I'm Ed Hazelwood. I'm the editorial director of Aviation Week Conferences and Television. And we have an unbelievable lineup of speakers for you today. As a matter of fact, I would dare to say today is probably going to knock your socks off. So uh, stick with us all day. You're going to have a great time. Before we get started with the uh, conference, however, I would like to uh, thank all of our sponsors. I'd like to point out that this is produced and presented by Aviation Week Conferences and Exhibitions and the Share Space Foundation. Our in association with partners are Boeing NASA Systems and Lockheed Martin. The conference is sponsored by Mead Instruments Corporation. We are in collaboration with the Centennial Flight Commission and American Airlines is the official airline of this conference. I think I've covered all of the bases there. Thank you to all of our sponsors, because we could not do this without you. So please, a round of applause for them. There are two people that had an awful lot to do with making this event happen, putting this conference together, and that's Buzz Aldrin and uh, Lisa Cannon. So if I could uh, just acknowledge him, Buzz. Lisa, thanks a lot. You guys poured your heart and soul into it. Thank you. Now, something I remind people to do at all of our events, and that is to uh, reach into your bag, your purse, uh, your uh, briefcase, wherever, pull out your cell phone, go to that button that says off or silent mode, and uh, please put it uh, in that position so that your phone does not ring while we're in the sessions today. Thank you very much. Also, uh, you should have found uh, in your seat or on the table in front of you a Space Imperatives Research Survey form uh, when you came in and took your seat. Please take the time today to fill these forms out. Uh, they break it out. They ask you questions session by session uh, according to the topics that we're going to be covering today. Uh, the session moderators are asked to please make sure that there's time at the end of each session, about a minute, minute and a half, uh, to let people fill it out based on that session at that point. Then we ask that you turn it in either at the end of the day at the registration desk or uh, when you uh, depart if you can't stay with us all day long. Thank you for that. Um, speakers. Uh, Discovery Channel is here and is uh, seeking to do interviews with lots and lots of speakers. So if you have a desire to do that after you have uh, finished your session, go to the back of the room, There'll be somebody there say, hey, I'd you know, like to talk to them, and uh, they will uh, direct you to a room where one-on-one -on -one interviews uh, with Discovery are being conducted, so uh, we can take care of that today. All of that done, ladies and gentlemen, now it is time to get started. And first up this morning is Ken Gazzola. He is the Executive Vice President of McGraw-Hill and publisher of Aviation Week. Ken, good morning. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Ed, and good morning, everyone. And uh, those of you who were with us last night, thanks for attending. It was a wonderful evening at the museum, and uh, it ended a little bit late for most of us, but uh, you're all here this morning, and we thank you. Uh, also, special thanks to Lydia Janow for setting up this event here in this Reagan building, because I think this is one of the exceptional venues. And uh, since this is a space conference, each of you will be issued a GPS to find your car afterward because this, I've never seen such a massive parking lot in my life. Yesterday was a great day. We celebrated 100 years of flight, and today we begin a new century of exploration. How quickly that changed. We thought it would be wise today to bring together the best minds in aerospace 
to look collectively into the future. And I'm very pleased that we have so many of the astronaut community here with us today, the pioneers of space joining us. The journey into space, as we well know, was born of the Cold War and the arms race. It was given a mission and a purpose by President Kennedy. With the moon landing achieved, we turned to the space shuttle and other missions ahead. Just think, Voyager 1 set off 26 years ago, and today is at the edge of our solar system. It's powerful information. We have put together and we have put spacecraft on Mars. And a week from today, the first of four US, European, and British spacecraft will return to that planet. Hubble is pioneering in the heavens. Looking back at creation. And these are powerful achievements to reflect on as we go through today. We know that manned spaceflight is not without risk. And the future of manned space flight will be front and center as we go through our agenda today. And we're all aware that the Columbia accident, the board pointed out that there's a lack of unified, clearly defined policy for the space program. And that's a big issue we're going to be talking about today. We expect to hear more from the president about that in the very near future. And the betting is on the use of the moon for development of space exploration technology. Not a surprise to many, and a, and, and a major piece of good news to many of us as well. I think Buzz and, and your peers have felt that way for years, and I think it's great that we have a measurable goal that we're going to be looking forward to. There are so many questions at this point, probably far more than there are answers. And what is the next generation vehicle that will take mankind into space? A big controversial issue today. Does it mean a return to capsules? What propulsion systems are, are on the horizon? What is the future of the space station? Another major issue. And a subject that came up at the AIA the other day, can we afford to have a space station and a moon research center? That's highly questionable in light of budgets today. For that matter, what is the future of international cooperation in space? Is it cooperation or is it subsidy? The list goes on. One thing is clear, that the value of going into space for world development is, is major. Space holds a very real, constructive, and measurable value for the future of our planet. Think of the critical role space now plays in medicine, oceanography, meteorolo meteorology, and geology, all of the Earth sciences that we have and enjoy. Our lives have been changed for the better by space. We now have a global communications infrastructure. Think about where we were before GPS, on land, in the air, and everywhere else. And the military GPS and SATCOMs are literally the nerve system of new network-centric operations, which, all, which seems to be the common thread where it's all going. The decisions will, which will be made in the next year to 18 months by the President and Congress will shape the entire generation of space exploration. The discussions here today can and should, and I underline should, contribute to that decision-making process. And we'll do our best at Aviation Week and all of our publications to promulgate the consensus opinions that come out of today so we can take it out to the Hill, the Pentagon, the world, rather than just 200 people that might be here today. And that's our mission in this event. Although the space era is only 40 years old, in some respects, the exploration of space is still in the infancy, particularly as aviation was 100 years ago. The challenge ahead remains of something that T.S. Eliot once said, which is very significant and timely for today. Only those who risk going too far can possibly find, find out how far one can go. So, Let's get started, and thank you. And uh, it gives me a great opportunity now to introduce an individual, Buzz Aldrin, a man who has orbited the Earth, walked in space, worked on the moon. Maybe you'll be going back there, Buzz, like John Glenn did. What a resume, a wonderful resume for a great man and a great friend of ours, and someone who has never given up 
pioneering and developing, not just sitting back on his laurels. On top of that, he's the founder of SpaceShare Foundation and StarCraft Boosters. ShareSpace is our partner today, and Buzz was really the originator of this conference and the main stimulus to get us all excited and energized to do this. And, and he's been at it for quite some time, and we're proud to be a part of it today. And Buzz has worked with Lisa Cannon, whom Ed mentioned earlier, and she's been a great, great part of this planning process. And Buzz has some terrifically interesting thoughts about the future of space flight, which you're, many of which you're all aware of. And he has tireless, tirelessly dedicated his efforts to bring new and innovative ideas to the fore and forging action, which is key to where we are going. And that's what it's all about, because Buzz is all about bringing ideas into action and making things a reality. A hundred years ago, Wright brothers had an idea. They brought it to reality. I give you Buzz Aldrin. Bring it into reality. Buzz. Terrific. All yours. Thank you very much, uh, Ed, for uh, kicking this off for us, and, and Ken for all those kind words. And uh, you've touched on so many different things that we're going to be uh, covering today. Uh, to me, this is a culmination and a beginning. It's the culmination of many years, months, weeks of uh, efforts that I've uh, attempted to put into building. Uh, a coalition, building a consensus. Uh, united we stand, divided we kind of circle the wagons and shoot inward instead of accomplishing what we're, uh, what we're after. <clears throat> Timing is always super critical. Timing is everything. It was in my life. Things that came along, opportunities that uh, presented themselves were just right in timing. And I think we have a great opportunity in timing uh, today. <clears throat> I hope that maybe what we've, we're trying to put together today is just a beginning. Uh, one of the things I'm trying to introduce into here is a feedback of, of what we're exposed to today. Can, can we get some thoughts and opinions from the people who are really experienced and in the know in looking and thinking about the future of human spaceflight? <clears throat> Uh, I spent some time with the National Space Society as its chairman, and many times we tried to bring together uh, NSS along with the Space Foundation. It looks like, uh, now that I'm no longer with them, that that's going, going to happen. Um, there are many other advocacy groups, and I would really like to see them kind of come together uh, instead of uh, really looking out for just their, their own particular agenda. I've wanted to build a consensus over uh, between a group of folks who came along at just the right time in history to be given uh, what a fantastic opportunity. 24 human beings, 24 Americans reached the moon. 18 of us are still alive. And of that 24, half of us had the great privilege to represent the progress of humanity by being able to walk on the surface of the moon. <clears throat> I've been trying to bring that group together and, uh, and we have a good representation. Uh, I had hoped that uh, the White House would have a particular recognition ceremony in conjunction with this next century of flight and this uh, particular conference. <clears throat> it looks like a lot of things have been on their mind. Uh, uh, with the Middle East that were not foreseen when, when a lot of these thoughts started coming into my mind. But we will have some sort of a uh, White House recognition uh, in, the, uh, in the spring, and we'll start working on that. <clears throat> ShareSpace Foundation came together in, in, in a, as a concept to me to be able to understand just <clears throat> how to advance the space program, the human space program. And one way to do that is to get more people involved into space. And that's why ShareSpace is dedicated to try and explain how public space travel, a new industry, will support everything else about space access as we put an emphasis to try and develop that 
new industry that will satisfy so many people and get the curiosity and inspiration behind. <clears throat> uh, I've seen a void that I've tried to fill, and that has to do with reusable rockets. And some of my uh, team members here from StarCraft Boosters, <clears throat> reusable boosters are here. Not not just everything. We're not trying to do the whole shebang. We're trying to work from the ground on up, make, make certain things reusable. <clears throat> um, so many thanks from me to, to all of you who've kind of listened to my uh, invitations to come here. And uh, uh, th there's one individual who's done an awful lot of work in trying to put together some of these uh, conferences. And, and I, I, he has a bit of a medical problem today, and I don't think he's here, but uh, Lewis Peach, many of you know him, and, uh, and he has devoted many tireless hours to trying to put together uh, some of these panels. The timeliness of Aviation Week deciding to have last night's gala opened up so many opportunity. I was trying to figure out when we're going to have this conference, and, and when you folks decided to have that gala last night, and, and then we could work with you uh, to, to help bring some people into that, and you could work with us, with your uh, wonderful professional staff that uh, I don't know what we'd have done without all the people that have uh, been helped in bringing that together. <clears throat> the next century of flight, we are at the beginning, just the beginning. We can't solve it all today, but I think we can introduce a, a number of creative thoughts that, that you and those listening in and, and those who hear about what we're doing can provide some gradual feedback and, and help us uh, build a consensus. Next century of flight, space imperatives. Where did that phrase come from? Well, space imperatives came from the recommendation three of the National, of the Commission on the Future for the U.S. Aerospace Industry, which I participated in uh, over a year ago. And uh, at lunchtime, we'll be hearing from the very able chairman of that group, uh, uh, former Congressman uh, Bob Walker. I've witnessed a number of efforts to bring people together with uh, the launch, organ launch systems. I've seen it evolve from uh, a, a not quite acceptable national launch system, an, an advanced launch system, a space lifter, Delta Clipper, SSTO, X-33, Space Launch Initiative, they, they all have not produced what we've been looking for. Uh, orbital space plane may have some longevity to it, I'm not sure. Uh, my group has been trying to introduce working with what we have. We have a shuttle launch system, and we can derive from that launch system a very capable way of... Uh, putting both humans and cargo into space for our visionary missions. <clears throat> While all of this has been coming about, I've seen the need after the Columbia accident and the wonderful work done by that board, the investigating board, <clears throat> I too have seen a need to provide vision for the leadership in our country. And I've prepared a group uh, and, and we're calling uh, this advisory group, this vision group, this space Vision Institute. That proposal has gone to the administrator of NASA, and I hope as the time goes on you'll understand what it is some very key people that we can bring together in support can do in service for their country that I don't believe has been done by the various organizations in the past. <clears throat> I have a patent that was submitted the day before 100 years from the Wright brothers. And I hope that this patent for multiple crew modules on single launch vehicles will help to introduce the objectives of uh, Share Space Foundation, of people into space, and open up the frontiers of space access that will really indeed make a difference. Uh, now, I've given you my commercials. Uh, I have uh, a few quick words, and I hope I don't take too much of your time, Alvin. Uh, it, it occurred to me that we needed a, 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 a broad-based, representing wide interests, person who has considered the future for his entire lifetime. As early as the beginnings of the 1960s, 
Alvin Toffler predicted the explosive rise of the computer. He wrote about PCs, electrical agents, virtual reality, and today's electronic networks decades before they appeared in the marketplace. He described the VCR before it had a name, portrayed the power and ubiquitousness of the internet, and depicted the coming of cable television when it was collectively agreed that advertisers would never back cable. His books include the classics, Future Shock, The Third Wave, as well as Power Shift, War and Anti-War, and Creating a New Civilization. These books have added numerous words and phrases to our language, from the third wave and demassification to the electronic cottage and overchoice. Today, the term future shock is now firmly embedded in our national lexicon. When Alvin Toffler takes a look at the future, he not only links that future to unrelated trends, but places the future into a coherent intellectual framework that provides us with the powerful tools for thinking about and preparing for the future. Please welcome a passionate thinker and a formidable futurist, and I hope a strong space supporter, Alvin Toffler. one is Alvin Toffler. <laughs> yeah, my name is Tom Johnson, and uh, I'm Alvin's partner in Toffler Associates, and the format we're using this morning is to be interactive. As Buzz has suggested, we want to make this a dialogue, so we're making this an interactive format. So I'm representing you, the audience and the questioners, and I'm going to be asking Alvin a series of questions. May I, sir? Shoot. Go. Okay. Launch. Launch. <laughs> <laughs> Is America going to be in the lead 25 years from now? Well, let me start by saying uh, that nothing lasts forever, including the lead of particular nations vis-a-vis -vis others. Uh, I think that uh, for, uh, for the United States to maintain the kind of uh, prominence and power that it has today, it's going to have to make a heck, heck of a lot of changes. Uh, and, but that's true for any country who has the lead. I would, however, like to introduce the notion that there's something wrong about uh, the idea that one country is number one. We, we had, uh, some years back, a decade or so ago, um, a whole wave of thinking that Japan is number one. But nations are multidimensional. And when you say they're number one, what is it you're talking about? Countries can be number one in, in civil liberties. Countries can be number one in economics. Countries can be number one in military power. Countries can be number one in the, in the uh, creation and distribution of knowledge. And so the question is, what kind of number one? And um, I think, uh, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll add, uh, summarize this with one uh, warning. I think that the United States is moving into a period of tremendous internal institutional crisis, that many of our institutions, starting with our schools and working our way through to other institutions in this society, are all either in or approaching internal crises. And when you look at across the board, it's education, it's pension plans, it's corruption in the stock exchange, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, you begin to see a larger pattern, and that is a pattern of institutional failure. And the reason for that, very simply, in my judgment, is that our institutions were designed for essentially a, an industrial economy and an industrial society, and we are no longer that. That we are now uh, creating a knowledge-based wealth system, which operates entirely differently from that of the industrial age. But our institutions have not caught up with our technological uh, developments and the, and the enormous breakthroughs in knowledge that the past 20, 30, 40, 50 years have seen. Great. Uh, Alvin, there's a, 
Editorial tomorrow that's going to be about space strategy and the need for it. Uh, do you think uh, we need a space strategy as a nation? Oh, I think we need a lot of strategies. I think, we, <laughs> I think again, if you look at all of our institutions, if NASA needs to re-examine re its mission, and if space needs to re, uh, if people in space need to rethink and develop some sort of long-term overall vision, if, as, as Buzz put it, uh, if not a more uh, concrete strategy, the same is true for most of our other institutions. And I would not exempt our political institutions, because I think our political institutions are malfunctioning as well. And, that, and so, yes, I think, uh, I think NASA and, and, and the entire space uh, enterprise of the country, not just NASA, uh, needs to be formulating some kind of vision of a where, to, you know, where do we want to go over the next half century? What's our purpose? What's our purpose in, uh, for existence? But more, more along with that, how do we fit in with other institutions? And my sense is that NASA, or, or space, uh, the space industry generally, in thinking about strategy, has thought more about its own internal capabilities and what can be done than how that then will impact other institutions uh, that we live with. And I think that, therefore, in the formulation of the next century strategy, uh, the, the, uh, we need to think about what's the internal changes that are required within the space community, shall we say, uh, but also how does that relate to various things happening outside in, in different fields. And therefore, um, I would look at, um, for example, uh, other technologies with which there can be convergences. Uh, we know that we're moving into a period in which biotech is going to be very important. We know that we're going, we're going to be dealing with new materials. We know a whole variety of other things. And, uh, and I would add to that um, that there are, um, that, that, that it's the convergence of technologies that make things really go, not just individual technologies. Technology advances systemically. And so if we can uh, look at the future of space, look at it uh, broadly from how it can interact with other emerging technologies, and then how does that affect or how can that serve uh, the, the society in general and, and different d industries uh, that are developing, I think that would be a helpful way to go. Are there particular third wave industries uh, or areas that need the help of the third wave and need the help of space? Well, there's one in particular that gets very little attention, which I think in the future can be one of the most important um, that we'll see. And maybe I'm uh, utopian about this, or maybe I'm uh, inadequately informed. But there is one particular industry that I think can um, transform uh, the relationships on, the, on planet Earth and can help crack the back of global poverty. And that is, I believe that we, we can, you, there, there is no way to solve the problem of poverty of billions of human beings so long as they have to survive by scratching at the soil with their hands or a stick. That there will be, coming out of the life sciences but also other fields, new technologies that are going to change the, the entire nature of agriculture so that it is no longer first wave, as we call it, first wave uh, agrarian peasant style labor, but high value added, uh, high value added activity. And that, is pro uh, that it will be producing not just food, but it'll be producing energy, it'll be producing pharmaceuticals, it'll be producing plastics, it'll be producing all kinds of things. And the question is, what can space add to that? And I think there are things that space already adds to that. For example, it seems to me that rather than uh, the traditional, uh, you go out and you fertilize an entire property, um, information that we can gather from space makes it possible for us to customize the way we treat each meter of the planet. And some places will need a little more, some may lead, need a lot less, and so on, so that we can deepen, greatly deepen our understanding of what we can do with the Earth, and um, uh, not to mention environmental considerations. But I, I really do believe that there will be a time when space and many emergent technologies on Earth are going to come together to make agriculture possibly into the most advanced industry we have. Alvin, why should citizens, business leaders, and government care about space? 
for all the reasons I just cited. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next question. <laughs> um, and let's, what, well, let me get to the next question. What's the fourth wave? Well, this is something uh, that uh, Tom, Tom, Tom knows the answer to that question because he was present at, it, at the origin of the answer. Oh, at the debate. <laughs> I was present. Yeah. The well, we had, um, um, my wife and I, uh, my wife Heidi works with me and has worked with me all our, all our careers, and, and she's a fantastic lady. But one of the things that she does is argue with me. I don't know where she gets that. And one of the things we've argued about over many, many years was this, this very question, what comes after the third wave of change which we're now going through? And I always used to say, well, biology, the next one. And she used to, and she finally said, no, no, no. The real, real revolution that follows will come when the human race gets serious about populating space. And that is the big one. And I think that is, in fact, where we're heading. And I thank all of you for whatever you're doing to move us in that direction. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alvin. Uh, we'll take a couple of questions from the uh, floor, if anybody has one. And Kathy, uh, there should be, a, but you need the microphone to do that. Uh, a, just stand up. Room is small, sir. Go ahead and just ask. Question. is regarding a spacefaring civilization and, and creating it, your thoughts. You know, there are things that you, that you subject to kind of scientific examination or other things you just know in your gut. Um, and in my gut, I believe that that is our human destiny. I don't, sure. believe, I don't believe that the species uh, that, the, that the, this, the human species is going to be ultimately constrained by the limitations of Earth. Another question? I have one quick one. Uh, relative to the moon, and uh, there's a lot of controversy as to whether we should have 25 years ago, 30 years ago, done something with our conquest of the moon, if you will, and uh, versus the space station. And the issue today is can we afford both? Where should we be going out there in terms of achievable goals? Don't forget Mars. And, and Mars. don't forget Mars, yeah. Well, yeah. Um, uh, I, I'm not the guy to ask that question, to answer that question. It's a question I ask rather than answer. Uh, anybody in this room knows more about the differences, the different costs, the different technological options and so forth th than I do. Uh, I, I simply am not in a position to, to, uh, you know, to take a stand on those. Yes, ma'am, you had a question. No, yeah, there is no microphone. Regarding failed institutions, the first one you mentioned was our education institution. Is there, what are creative, constructive, um, useful ways to begin to change that or look at a direction to change that so that we can uh, train future generations so uh, to to help us get into space, stay in space, and establish a new generation in space. Well, to begin with, I think the the, the dominant fault of our existing education system is that it was designed essentially to produce obedient wor uh, workers for industrial society, and that uh, and that uh, the assumption is that uh, if students do 15 years of rote and repetitive work, they'll be ready to give their lives to doing rote and repetitive work in factories. And that, um, uh, if, uh, uh, yeah, that you need uh, obedience rather than uh, innovation. Uh, obedience and the smart kids, of course, uh, uh, know which questions not to ask uh, and so on. So the system was designed, and, uh, and not consciously designed, it organically grew up to service the society within which it was embedded. And the society in which our education system was embedded was a society that was moving from agriculture to, a ma to mass manufacture, mass production, mass media. Uh, and, and by the way, not just mass production, but also mass markets, mass media, uh, mass uh, and, and uh, ma weapons of mass destruction. The sociologists wrote whole libraries of stuff about the emergence of the mass society. And the assumption when we, my wife and I, wrote Future Shock was the general assumption was that more technology means more massification. 
And we have been arguing ever since then that the new technologies create greater individualization. And so therefore you get custom, custom production or mass customization as a step in that direction. You have marketers talking about personalization of marketing and markets of one. Uh, or uh, niche markets and so forth and so on. And what is happening in other fields is the, the de what we call the demassification of the mass society under the impact of information technology and other tools. Uh, so we're becoming, in my judgment, a far more complex society than we were before, a, a far more rapidly changing society than we ever were before, with an economy that requires workers who think and who can innovate and who can challenge uh, you know, uh, conventional ideas. And that's not what you get out of the school system. It was designed for a different purpose. And the problem is that it, has, it is institutionally so embedded that it's extremely difficult to change. And so uh, uh, while I am a product of the public schools and I favor public education, the fact is I will do anything to help diversify the system, to provide alternatives. For example, I don't know how good charter schools are, but they are at least an attempt to alter the system, to provide greater variety. And I notice that at least one of our presidential candidates is attacking them uh, because that gets in the way of, a, of the union, basically and so on. So uh, there are many, many changes, but overall the general picture that, I, that uh, or change that I would argue for is a tremendous diversification of educational opportunities in the country. Almost sounds like the disobedient will rise. Well, <laughs> <laughs> yes sir, right over here John. Micro yeah, I'm pointing at you sir, the microphone's heading your way. I wonder if you have a vision or an idea relative to intellectual property. I've worked in corporations. Um, I'm something of a serial entrepreneur. It runs in the family. But uh, the form that a person is expected to fill out working for a, a corporation pretty much says your brain is going to be left in a bottle if we enforce this when you leave the company. Um, that's a real challenge to a knowledge-based society and to the property rights on which our, company, our country is founded, and it's worked so well for us, I think. Comments, please? Well, as an author, having been ripped off in country after country after country to the, to the tune of millions of copies of unpaid-for books, <laughs> uh, I share the, uh, the, 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 the concern. Uh, however, um, I, I think, and, and I, I, I've tried to figure out a, a solution to this, and I d confess I don't have one, but it strikes me that we're trying to solve the problems of intellectual property protection with models that were based on protecting physical goods, uh, on models that just don't, legal models I'm talking about, that no longer apply to this uh, system as it now exists. And I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not a lawyer. Uh, and I'm not a, a specialist in this, but you can see more and more the, the in, on the one hand, you see people trying to lock up uh, ideas and, and uh, control them for their own economic advantage. And on the other hand, you see this tremendous wave of technologies and, and, uh, and, and ways of, of avoiding uh, the legal restrictions on, on property rights uh, with respect to in intellectual property. So I think that, um, I mean, you see, you see the struggles that the, the music industry is going through and the, and the uh, movie industry pretty soon or will, will uh, have to face better than it is now and so on. So this is, a, this is a tremendous issue and it has enormous geopolitical consequences. It's not just you and I may be get, getting ripped off. It is uh, one of the dominant conflicts in the world trade system today is between the poor countries that are demanding rights, uh, uh, that are demanding certain, um, the end, for example, of subsidies to agriculture in Europe and the United States. But agriculture is their big industry and agriculture is what they're really worried about. We, on the other hand, are negotiating for intellectual property rights. Many of those countries, until recently, didn't even know what we're talking about. You know, why does that matter? People are starving over here and they're growing food and you're taking their live, uh, uh, they, the claim is that we're taking their, their, uh, you know, economic base away from them. Uh, so I think that there, this issue 
uh, rises up to the level of global trade and global conflict and the, the walkout of several countries from the a group of countries from the World Trade Organization talks in Cancun recently, you know, focused on the collision between these two issues. And I think it's going to be quite a time, uh, a turbulent, messy time before we figure out what to do about it. I mean, somebody, you, you publish a magazine, somebody's ripping off that magazine even as we sit here. It may even be me. <laughs> <laughs> Copying a page that I can use for research. You know? <laughs> Ken wants to ask one last question, and last we're going to make question. this the last one. This is almost a, a book unto itself, but what do you see ahead for the next 25 years for China versus the United States, and particularly in technology development? China's leaders, I think, are extremely smart. Uh, I think they understand, first of all, they clearly understand and even use the language of first wave, second wave, third wave transformations. They understand that. They know that, that um, now what they're doing is they're, they have imported, they've changed their system to invite foreign direct investment, and they have taken on and are sweeping the world, sweeping up uh, um, low-tech Ma uh, manufacturing jobs from all over the world, not just in the United States, but from Mexico and from all over. Um, that's, sec this, that's a second wave industrialization strategy. But they, are very, but they are very smart, I said. And one of the reasons, by the way, is that if you look at Chinese leadership, not just uh, the current leadership, but the last group as well and even before, these people understand technology the way, for example, the Europeans simply don't. And one of the reasons for that, there are two reasons. One, they grew up as Marxists. And if you scrap everything that Marx ever said and look for one thing that he said that we can agree with now is that technology is important economically and sociologically. He made that case and they learned that. They learned that from the ground up. And the second thing is most of them, or many of them, were engineers. They went to engineering schools in Moscow and here and there and the other place, and they come to technology. They tech, if the Europeans are technophobic, they are technophiliac, right? So China has, is led by people who, who I think have a grip on where this thing is going. On the other hand, they have undertaken to raise essentially a billion human beings out of poverty in a 20 or 30 year period. Now, can that be done? Maybe. Can it be done without internal friction and unrest and losers and winners and conflict? No. So I believe we're going to see upheavals within China. I think we'll see more Tiananmen squares as they try to maintain a degree of stability. And they use the word stability a lot. They know that they can't go forward if they become unstable. Uh, and the word stability to them means something different than it does to us. When we say stability, we say, oh, yeah, yeah, we need stability. When you say that to them, you're talking to people who are alive who saw 20 or 30 million of their relatives slaughtered within their lifetime in the Cultural Revolution. So stability has a big emotional impact for them that it doesn't have for us. Now, that's why uh, what I, and, and so there are two things I would say about China. One, I don't believe in straight line projection as a, as a valuable method of forecasting, of human events. And, uh, and uh, people who say China's growing at this rate, it's going to continue to grow at this rate for 20 years, I think that's naive and, and uh, uh, unlikely. Um, so that's, that's uh, uh, that we shouldn't be thinking about it in terms of straight lines. Second, we tend to over-economize, uh, uh, that is, we look at the economics without adequately looking at the internal politics and the internal social changes and stresses. Uh, so I would not assume uh, that China will uh, get through this next 25 or 30 years without some kind of bumps, big bumps along the road. And the question is, what do we, how do we react to all of that? And, uh, and finally, of course, as I said, we, I, I don't have to tell anybody in this room about their interest in space, but their interest in other high technology, and, and they're, they're geared to it. So what they're following is they're following two strategies simultaneously. One is industrialization, second wave standard uh, industrialization of the kind that we have previously seen only now again across global borders, and third wave, a third wave strategy as well. Get all the advanced technology you possibly can, become what they call a bio superpower, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, I think that they are, I think they're formidable. 
I think they, they have thought through this strategy more clearly than most other countries have, but that they're going to have lots of difficulty in implementing it. Ladies and gentlemen, Alvin Toffler. Alvin, thank you. <laughs> yeah, but listen, I want to say one thing. This guy, who's, who's very quiet and very modest, is a great stimulus. He's a guy who thinks, and a guy who's got a lot of great ideas and knows a lot about things that I don't know much about. <laughs> okay, yeah, I know you okay, take care. Okay, thanks. All right, ladies and gentlemen, if I can get the first panel, that we're going to do the uh, panel on the pass and get all of the members of that to come up here. We'll get your name tag set up. Uh, we're obviously already running late, and uh, so that means we'll take it out of your breaks, okay? But we'll get there. Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Roger Lanius, and I'm the chair of the Space History Division over at the National Air and Space Museum. I was asked to uh, chair the panel on the past this morning. We have a uh, serbs, uh, superb set of presentations by some stellar people that are going to be uh, giving them. Uh, one of the things that I'd like to do in kind of uh, uh, beginning this presentation is to, uh, first off, bring up the slides. And, uh, and a second, uh, send the regrets of Harrison Schmidt, who was supposed to be with us today but could not make it. And uh, uh, he wishes us well for the presentations uh, that we have and the considerations and deliberations that are going to take place during the day. We stand at a remarkable cusp in the history of space flight and maybe in the history of the human race. Um, we are. 45 years into the space age, uh, and uh, it's been an interesting ride. We've had lots of accomplishments, uh, and uh, obviously bright things for the future are before us. But at the same time, we are in something of a midlife crisis in the context of space exploration, even as we have only dipped our toes into the cosmic ocean. There are a couple of things that I would like to, uh, to bring to your attention as we consider this today, and the panelists will be expounding on various aspects of these as we go through the morning. Um, the first thing I would like to suggest to you is that uh, NASA and space exploration in general has been an, a, a function that has been nice to have but not critical to uh, the uh, uh, overall society of the United States. And it's important, I think, to understand as we look at the history of spaceflight where the NASA budget and the space exploration budget has set in the national priorities. I've got a slide here that shows you the NASA budget as a percentage of the federal budget from roughly 1959 up to about the present. What you will see is a spike in the early 1960s. Uh, going up to a grand total of 3.3% of the federal budget in 1965. That's still not very much money, but in those days it was $5.2 billion. 
um, and 3.3, as I say, percentage of the federal budget. That was the high point of Apollo. That was the investment that was made to allow us to go to the moon. And it falls off the table even as the Apollo missions are taking place in the latter 1960s and early 1970s. Uh, we're seeing the uh, expenditures decline as a percentage of the budget, and they have leveled off uh, by the early 1970s at about 1%, slightly less than that. That's where it has remained ever since. That is the equilibrium point uh, for federal and, and public expenditures of the Treasury to engage in space flight. That's what we're willing to spend. Nobody much questions it when it's about that 1% mark. If we want to do things beyond that, we're going to have to engage in a much more compelling set of arguments as to why those have to be done, why we need to plus that budget up in the future uh, to a 3.3 you know, or even a higher percentage of federal expenditures. And uh, that has not been done as yet but the equilibrium point is slightly less than 1%. I would also suggest to you this next slide. Uh, this is a set of polls. We went back and we looked at all the polls we could find throughout the history of spaceflight that asked the question, should the government fund human trips to the moon? First poll is June of 1961, which was right after Kennedy's announcement that we should go to the moon. Uh, the last poll that I found was July of 95. There's probably some that have been undertaken since that time that I haven't tracked down. Uh, but in every case save one, the majority of the public opposes the idea. The one exception is October of 65, and I wish I knew why that was. <laughs> Maybe Buzz or some of the other folks uh, uh, can comment on that, but, but that's the case. We did not go to the moon in the 1960s because everybody thought it was a great idea. We went to the moon for geopolitical reasons. Absent those geopolitical reasons, it's questionable whether or not we would have done so on the schedule at least that we chose to undertake it. Uh, that is an important, I think, piece of our past. And it's also important as we plan for the future. Uh, because lots of people are talking about going to Mars. Now, that doesn't seem to be in the presidential discussions at present. Maybe it is, but as a subtext set of polls from 69 to 99 asking the similar question about going to Mars. If we would decide to send humans to Mars, we would also do it, not because everybody thought it was a great idea, but because there was some reason other than that to undertake it. Uh, you have to ask yourself the question, in the Mars context especially, what is the trigger mechanism, the socio-political event that would uh, that would engage the President, the Congress, the American public, all to agree that uh, this is something that they wanted to undertake. That's an important set of questions that I think uh, need to be explored for the future, but they are also important in the context of the past. This morning, I've got four superb panelists here. Um, the, our first speaker is going to be Howard McCurdy. Uh, Jeff Bingham was who I was going to name, but Jeff is unfortunately could not be here. And, uh, and uh, if he does come in a little bit later on, we'll put him in. But Howard uh, is going to talk a little bit about the context of, of uh, the post-Apollo planning and space station especially. He's the chair of the Department of Public Administration. Uh, he's a renowned space policy expert. Many of you have probably read some of his books. Uh, recently, he wrote a book, and you will love this, Faster, Better, Cheaper, Low-Cost Innovation in the U.S. Space Program, and I think his conclusion is not unlike a lot of, of yours, pick two. Uh, Howard, I'll give it to you. Actually, we're going to do Bob first. Oh, you want to do Bob first? <laughs> All right, first mistake. Um, we, will, we will hold off Howard then, and we will, uh, we will ask um, um, Bob Thompson to speak. Uh, Bob is a uh, very well-known uh, policy manager. He was a shuttle program manager at JSC in the 1970s. Uh, he has been involved in all manner of, uh, of space exploration debate and space policy aspects. And uh, with that, I will turn it over to Bob. And I'll knock this down if I can figure out how to do it. I'll go back and put the budget up. Okay, I will do that. We'll just leave that up there while we talk.
There you go. Well, good morning. I would like to, first of all, uh, explain a little bit why I'm here. I'm here because I got a phone call from Buzz one day that I didn't happen to be on the golf course. And then Buzz was smart enough to put the task in the hand of Lisa, who called back. And they made it so compelling for me to get off the golf course and come up here and spend 12 minutes explaining what has gone on for the last 45 years <laughs> and why I'm responsible for having screwed up everything. So if you'll bear with me, I'm going to take 12 minutes and try to do that. Uh, by way of background, you need to also know where I'm coming from. Uh, I went to work for NACA right after World War II at the Langley Research Center. Now, back then it was called the Langley Memorial Aeronautical Laboratory. And we were sitting down in Hampton, Virginia, very quietly creating research information to help our airplane industry. Uh, the Wright, not many people remember, but Orville Wright was a member of the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics at that time. And we were sitting there fat, dumb, and happy. We were also contributing a little bit to what was called the International Geophysical Year. And that's a little footnote in history that's been dropped. We actually had an Earth satellite program underway as part of our contribution to the International Geophysical Year. And we, the United States, as part of the contribution of the worldwide group of nations that was performing the International Ge Geophysical Year things, we were going to put a small grapefruit-sized satellite in Earth orbit. Uh, one day we all got up and we heard a beep beep. And, you know, this is pretty intelligent communication. It goes beep, beep, beep. And you'd be amazed at what wideband communication that was. It instantly uh, galvanized the thought process in this country. And some people, maybe not all, but some people thought that that beep, beep meant we're better than you are. And it immediately galvanized the activity in this country. It didn't take a meeting like this, it took a beep beep. And in response to that, the Eisenhower administration very quickly passed the National Space Act. And I very quickly found that I was working for an agency that had the space mission as well as the aeronautical mission. And I'd like to correct something here or add to something these budget numbers cover human space flight, they cover unmanned space flight, they cover all the aeronautical research work we do in this country within NASA. It's a total NASA budget. That is not a human space flight budget. But in any event, this country moved quickly under Eisenhower. We embarked on the Mercury program. Shortly thereafter, Kennedy became president. Uh, we got a little bit more external involvement, bays of pigs and things of that nature. And all of a sudden, this young dynamic president got up one day and said, let's go to the moon. And he, said, he didn't say, let's go to the moon because an advisory committee met in Washington and told us to do that. He went to the moon for other reasons. Uh, you've been kind and put them geopolitical. I'll put them in some more crude terms. Anything you can do, I can do better. And there was a lot of that. And therefore, with the external world situation, and when Kennedy got up and said, let's go to the moon, he also asked uh, Jim Webb, who was the head of NASA at that time, Jim, what do you think it's going to cost? Jim thought a few days, and he went back to Kennedy and says, well, I think somewhere between 20 and $40 billion. Now, let me just have you stop and think. If we go to Congress today and say we've got a program that'll cost somewhere between 50 and $100 billion, what do you think might happen to us? So affordability is something that, whether we like it or not, we have to keep in front of us. Also, to correct arithmetic, which you've already corrected, we're here in Washington, and we're down in Kitty Hawk yesterday commemorating 100 years of flight. But we're here today talking about 45 years of flight, human space flight. At least that's my subject. And I would like to break that into two time periods. 
The first one is about the first one-third of that 45 years, which I call the initial activity or the Apollo activity. And the combination of what was done in the Eisenhower administration and what was done in the Kennedy administration set us on a path that within 12 years to do Mercury, Gemini, Apollo, and do all the formation of Skylab came out of that decision that was made in the period of time between 1958 and 1961. And relatively few questions were asked about what's it going to cost. As we approach now the second phase I want to talk about, which encompasses the last two-thirds of that 45 years, from 58 or from 68 to 70, say from 70 to where we are today, the second two-thirds of that 45 years. I happened to talk to Gene Cern as I came into the uh, room this morning. And Gene said, hell, one of the things with the uh, problem of spaceflight today is we don't have an objective. We don't have a mission. And I said, what do you mean, Gene? We've had a mission for the last 23 years. He says, like hell we have. No one's told us where to go. And that's a very important observation he made. Because when this country made the decision that I call a post-Apollo decision to shift the human spaceflight activity back to low Earth orbit and to build a space station, and a space station is probably a bad terminology. We probably should have called it a research laboratory. The purpose of the space station at that time was to understand really what are the pros and cons of man operating for long periods of time and zero weightless in a space environment. What does it take to go out of the gravity well of the Earth and go into that kind of a flight environment with pieces of equipment, electrical power generation stations, environmental control stations? What happens to the calcium in the body over long periods of time? We need a research center in low Earth orbit that we can afford and operate that for a number of years to find out what we have to do to make humans capable of operating for several years in space. What we need to do to learn how to generate large amounts of electrical power. I bumped into Charlie Walker coming in. Charlie spent a good part of his career trying to understand what we call continuous flow electrophoresis coming out of Skylab and into shuttle. Are there some wonderful pharmaceutical manufacturing possibilities in space? And if so, can we make it economically feasible to fly out of the gravity well of the Earth, go up there, manufacture those pharmaceuticals, and bring them back? So now let me tell you about the last 23 years. As we came down off of the Apollo spending, I was involved intimately in trying to decide how to build a shuttle and how to build a space station. There had been a lot of argument in this country if you went back and looked at the Collier's Magazine of the early 50s, space stations were great big rotating mechanisms. And space shuttles were nice little delta wing vehicles flying all over the place up there, some of them using lateral control in the absence of gravity and flying around. And we were just going to zoom back and forth to that big hotel in the sky and do all these things. Well, let me tell you, it takes a hell of a lot of money to zoom around in low Earth orbit. Whether we like it or not, a vehicle that takes off from the surface of the Earth today has to be greater than 90% fuel, and you have to consume all that fuel in the next eight minutes. If you get on a 747 to go to Australia, it's about 46% fuel, and you consume it in the next nine hours. It's a hell of a difference. But in any event, we had the big debate on space station. Should it be a big rotating thing launched with a Nova-class vehicle? Whether you like it or not, the argument came down on the side of creating a modular space station. And a modular space station meant that you built it in pieces. And some of it you actually built on orbit. We started space station with the idea that we would, first of all, put a big truss structure up there. It's a little bit like if you're going to go in business here on Earth, you can go out and buy a piece of land. If you're going to go in business in low Earth orbit, you need to put a big truss structure up there so you have some place to hang your electrical power generating system, so you have some place to hang your radiators, so you have some place to locate your house, 
you have some place to locate your factory. And if you're going to operate a factory, you need a truck. And if you're going to build a space station, you need a truck that can take modules that you want to build up there, can move them around, can dock them, position them where you want. You're going to have to have a crane. And if you're going to bring things back, you have to come back with a payload. And by that time, we were tired of landing out in the ocean with a small-sized Navy each time we flew. We liked to come back and land on a runway like a dignified airplane. We also had some pretty stringent instructions at that time. A lot of people we talked to in the power base and the government and the executive branch, Bureau of Budget and so forth, they quite often said, we don't give a damn what you do, just bring it down to 1% or less. And that 1% covers everything NASA does. So within that umbrella, we looked at building the slow Earth orbital infrastructure. Well, common sense tells you if you're going to have the space station, you've got to have the space shuttle first, right? That's, not, that's, that's a no-brainer. We talked to the president at that time, Richard Nixon. The chairman of the Space Council at that time was his vice president, Spiro Agnew. They went through all of the pros and cons. We looked at all kinds of things. We looked at going out of the business. We looked at building a shuttle and a modular space station. We looked at expanding the Apollo hardware for lunar colonization. We even talked about man mounting an Apollo program for Mars exploration. The decision in the country at that time is we will go to option number two, which is low Earth orbit. We will approve your building a space shuttle. And if the shuttle works, then some later group can approve building a space station and we'll be on with it. Now, let me make a point that I'd like to leave with you. At the time that decision was made, number one, the president did not feel that he wanted to get up and make a Kennedy-type pronouncement. He didn't get up and say, we're going to now operate a research center in low Earth orbit, and we're going to learn how to live and operate in space. That was never done. And I can't say as I blame him, because coming after the Kennedy pronouncement, that would look like a, a, a second order kind of a activity. He wasn't interested in doing that. So he didn't tell the nation what we were going to do for the next 20 years or 25 years. I personally thought we would accomplish building the shuttle and getting a two or three years good operation of the space station in something like 15 to 20 years. We're now 33 years into that, and we still haven't got the space station up there. So I'm going to stop here and take some questions. I would like to end up with two comments. And these comments come from having gone around the country and talked to people. And I'm often amazed at how different contemporary history is from the eyes of different people. If you saw it from one part of the system, you have one idea of what caused things to happen. I ran into Dick Gordon last night. I hadn't seen Dick in a long time. I don't know whether Dick's here right now, and I will uh, apologize to Dick for telling on our private conversation. But Dick said to me, Hi, the Air Force made you put that great big payload in the shuttle. I said, No, Dick, they did not. That was not an Air Force requirement. The payload of the space shuttle is 60 feet long because we studied modular space stations. We looked at modules 10 feet in diameter, 30 feet long. We looked at modules 15 feet in diameter and 40 feet long. We liked a 15 foot diameter and 40 foot long module for the space station. You take a 40 foot module and then you put a docking system between that and the back of the cockpit of the orbiter and you'll find out why we have a 60 foot payload bay in the orbiter. You will also find that when the Air Force took a look at that, they said, wait, that's fine. That accommodates all of our payloads. Yeah, you build the orbiter, and if we like it, if it's cheap enough and it fits our needs, we'll use it. So did the Air Force derive the payload bay of the orbiter, or did NASA do it? I maintain that NASA did it. We built exactly the vehicle we wanted to build. The vehicle, I think, now stop and think about it. It takes... 65,000 pounds, roughly, due east out of the Cape. It can take up to 10 people if you want to configure it accordingly. It can rendezvous 
Buzz helped in very early rendezvous. I can remember when Buzz first came to the program, he came with a good education from MIT, one of the few people who really understood orbital mechanics. Most of us came out of an aerodynamic background. And hell, Buzz was a hero. He understood a little bit of the equations of motion, understood a little bit on how to rendezvous, understood a little bit on how per people might work in EVA and things of that nature. So he made some tremendous technical contributions. Now we go up with the shuttle and routinely rendezvous and dock. There's nothing to it. Hell, it wasn't. We worked on it pretty hard, didn't we, Buzz, for several years? Uh, you go to uh, Houston today, you will see probably the world's largest swimming pool where we work out the things we do in EVA routinely today. Uh, the first time we uh, sent Ed White out EVA, his whole task was to float around out there for a little while, squirt a little uh, gun that squirted air out, and then get the hell back in the capsule as quickly as he could and try to get the door closed. We now go up and routinely service something as complicated as the Hubble Space Telescope. The management in NASA abandoned the EVA erectable truss on the space station because they set up a panel to tell them whether it was too much EVA, and the panel told them it was too much EVA, so they went to a pre-integrated truss. That pre-integrated truss cost a lot of money to change after we'd already been underway with EVA erectable truss. It cost time, cost dollars. You can still build a space station with a pre-integrated truss, but we now don't, no longer go up there and build it and run the electrical wires and so forth like you would if you were putting a factory up here in uh, Virginia somewhere. So the space station is still a very good program, but it's about 10 years behind. And in my opinion, for the next several years, we need to do two things. We need to get the shuttle program healthy again, and we need to complete the first plateau of space station research and development and understand the medical, manufacturing, pharmaceutical, operational, other things out of that research laboratory. If as a nation we can afford to run a research laboratory in Virginia to do aeronautics, we can afford to run one in space to understand what the space flight activity is all about or the space environment's all about. And then I'll be very much in favor of supporting, finding a way to support exploration, finding a way to support entrepreneurial activities in space, but there's a hell of a lot of this research laboratory we call the space station that we just ain't done yet, and we need to be on with it. Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll, we'll take questions at the end of the uh, presentations, but uh, at this point in time, I'd like to introduce uh, Jeff Bingham, who did arrive. He mumbled to me as he sat down, I hate commuting. Um, and I. I'm very sympathetic to that. Uh, he is uh, going to come forward. Uh, J uh, Jeff is a uh, special assistant to the administrator. He had been the uh, legislative uh, affairs person at NASA for uh, some time. Uh, he's been, I think, at NASA almost as long as I was there, back from the early 1990s. Uh, he has been working of late on a uh, legislative, basically, a history of the space station. And uh, his topic today is a uh, space station concept. Jeff? Thanks a lot. Delighted to be with you. I'm not going to actually use these, but uh, this, <laughs> they make a nice backdrop. Uh, and when you see a couple of these, you'll see why you'll be happy. I'm not going to actually plow through them. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about station, a little bit more about station. Um, obviously, uh, 
uh, space space station, space flight is a little different interpretation of uh, the definition of flight that Wilbur and Orville had in mind 100 years ago. Um, I'm sure they couldn't imagine that this would be in one of the eventual expressions of having discovered the principles of flight. Uh, the fact that we've got some arrays that look kind of like wings helps a little bit to make that transition, but we're talking about a whole new, new kind of space flight here, or flight here. Um, a space station idea is not new. Um, you can see on this chart up in the uh, upper left-hand corner uh, the brick moon uh, back in 1869, one of the first expressions of what a space station might look like uh, by Edward Everett Hale. Uh, began uh, some people at least thinking, I was thinking about space station, I always like to remember Hale because he was, he, he was the first connection between, between a space station and Congress um, because in, in an indirect way. He ended up, when he passed away, he was the chaplain of, this, of the U.S. Senate, but he had written this, uh, this uh, publication back in 1870, published in, in uh, Atlantic <laughs> Monthly magazine about this fictional space station. And uh, it was some time before anybody really sat down and tried to begin designing a space station per se. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that history. What I want to do is I'm going to, in, the, in sort of in the scheme of how we've got this structured, talk a little bit more about some of that early history, not in detail, just to kind of cover some of the, the, the major points. And then uh, I'm going to skip over the point where we reached the decision to build a space station. And Dr. McCurdy will talk more about that in detail, I believe. And then we can kick around in Q&A, other, other points there. And then I want to come, uh, I'll go over, over past the decision and get into the uh, sort of the tortured path that the space station has taken since we made that decision in 84 to the point of getting out of orbit with something and where we go from here and spend some time uh, talking about that. Um, Bob talked a little bit about uh, the, uh, the, the post-Apollo. Um, as, as Apollo began to get sort of settled in in the mid-60s, 64, 65, uh, some folks at NASA justifiably thought we need to be thinking about where we go next. For one thing, they could see it, that they're going to have, have a workforce that needed something to do that had been geared up to work on, uh, on the Saturn V. And uh, so there were a lot of efforts uh, expended in trying to do an extended Apollo. Where do we go with Apollo? We've got all this hardware. We know how it works. We know what we can do with it. And uh, so there was quite a lot of energy expended uh, on, on station-type options using the Apollo framework. I was kind of surprised when I started this project that Roger mentioned, uh, working on a space station history. I decided not to just start it at 84 or even 81 when the decision started to build, but to go back and look at what had gone before, and there was a lot of effort. Um, the, the, uh, this chart, and again, you'd be glad I'm not going through these, <laughs> but this sort of depicts some of uh, those, early, those early activities that were based on an extension of Apollo. You had Apollo extension, Apollo applications, and eventually evolved into Skylab, which uh, Owen will talk a lot more about. Uh, later as well, um, and uh, but the idea of uh, of a station was actually first uh, a part of the the, the long range plan that NASA developed in 1959, uh, and that plans really, if you look look back on on history, sort of set the DNA of space exploration. I mean, the fundamental aspects of what we're talking about today, what we'll be talking about later today about the future, really are were captured in that plan. Uh, Apollo obviously was a kind of a leapfrog, we leapfrogged the moon over the station in the sequence of events that was in that original plan. But ever since then, we've been sort of getting back in and conforming to that basic logical sequence of events that pretty much was illustrated by all these different efforts uh, to try to establish a framework for a, a space station and use that as a springboard for further space exploration to the moon and beyond. Um, but, but that period in the, in the, in the 60s, the 65 um, through 67, was a period of increasing frustration for NASA as well because you had, you started to have the successful realization of the Apollo program, but you also had new, n new things coming into play, new issues, uh, new priorities. You had uh, the Vietnam War was growing. You had 
a new president with President Johnson and the Great Society uh, agenda that he had. Uh, limited amount of resources uh, available in the overall governmental budget to try to fit NASA into and NASA's programs. So you had quite a lot of frustration with his growing capability and new experience and nowhere to put it. And uh, eventually we ended up, of course, getting, uh, trying to get back on to the, after, after the lunar missions, get back to that original schedule and get back in with the shuttle and, and then the station. Tried in 69 to get a combination, a package deal with uh, the shuttle station together, uh, kind of concurrent evolution and uh, President Nixon, as Bob described, decided that wasn't going to work. Uh, so, we, so we missed out on that package deal opportunity, which would have sort of got us right back into the middle of where we had started in, the, in 1959. Um, but we kept studying. Uh, Sylvia Fries did a, study, uh, did a paper back in 85. She counted 100 space station studies between 1959 and 1984, over 100 different studies. A lot of them are represented in this chart. Uh, a lot of the, some of the, you see the vertical blocks, those are some of the dead ends we reached along the way. And uh, you'll have to wait for the book to get, the <laughs> to get all the details here. There's a lot of interesting stuff that went on in kind of, in how all these different initiatives got started and got, re, got uh, redirected and ended. Uh, fascinating to me, study. And, uh, and we'll get into a little bit about that maybe in Q and A's. Um, but, uh, Obviously, I, I, we're not going to take the time to go into the detail of this. Uh, I want to talk about lessons, some of the lessons we learned through this tortured history. Because anything that we're going to be doing as we talk about the future is going to rely on that experience base that we've got. We've, got, we've learned how to, we've, we've got a space station. Believe it or not, we actually have a space station in being. And some of us who have been involved in this program wondered if we'd ever get beyond view graphs. Some, we, have and we have a partial station. And Bob's absolutely correct. We need to finish that job and get to the point where we can turn it into something that is, contributes to the next step. And we'll talk a little bit about that in, in a second as well. Um, one of the uh, important parts of these lessons learned, obviously, is the role of Congress in dealing with the administration and NASA. And it's one thing to, to have a presidential pronouncement of a goal or a commission that points the way, but you've actually got to do something with those words and those goals and those visions. And um, in, in the early, in the mid-60s, uh, George Miller, Miller was uh, making a presentation. I want to show this other chart. This is, this is probably, probably one of the busiest chart ever devised and actually presented, not only in a hearing in, in August of 1965, but at a staff briefing. And uh, I, again, I just put it up there for illustrative purposes. Uh, I sort of highlighted the, uh, the station pieces of that uh, to show that station, and the idea of station, this 1965, September 2nd, uh, was a fundamental element of almost anything you talked about for the future at some level, at some point. It fit all over the place. Um, whatever you call it, research complex, a logistics facility, you know, communications, observation. Uh, we ended up, as we'll talk uh, after, after Howard talks, we'll talk about uh, how we ended up sort of combining a lot of those missions into a single uh, bag, which we promised, uh, some would say over-promised, uh, to present to the, you know, to the American people in the way of a, of a station that would do everything. And, uh, and some of the tortured path that I described has had to do in recent years with how we continue to justify the space station based on all those different elements. But I thought this was a great, a great chart. Uh, and if you read, you, you read the brief, there's a whole briefing on this uh, that they gave to the, to the congressional staffers. And, uh, and, and Bob Siemens also participated in that, which is another dynamic that's interesting. Again, you had, you had Apollo, this is 65, so you still had had missions in Apollo to fly. Jim Webb, a consummate politician, was being very careful not to, uh, to divert attention away from the immediate task at hand at NASA. At the same time, he recognized we needed to begin thinking about the future. These are, you know, to do something in space, obviously, you have long lead times. 
So you can't just wait till you finish Apollo and then think about what else to do. Again, I mentioned the workforce, you've lost that expertise. If you've lost those assembly lines, if you decide you want to continue with Saturn V and so on. So there was a, this tentative step to, that was steps that were taken in 65. Siemens attended this meeting and he spent a lot of time describing the planning process uh, in a tutorial. It was literally a tutorial on phase A, B, C. And, uh, so on, and how you plan, and, and all that was designed to inform the, the staffers and the members, but not get them thinking that we were overreaching. And uh, it was a very fascinating, fascinating uh, exercise. And uh, I'm getting the high sign here to hurry up. So I'm gonna hurry up uh, and uh, talk a little bit about, uh, about the realities again of, of, uh, of the station uh, in terms of, of uh, let's just slip, slip ahead to that slide and the realities of actually implementing uh, the program. Uh, this is something I started years ago. It's still far from incomplete, needs to be updated. But again, it's illustrative to give you an idea of the kinds of realities that we have to face in dealing with a program. Now, this is a matter of congressional uh, assistance to uh, NASA in dealing with space station. And you can see sort of some categories of activities that are colored, basically, the. You know, Congress helps us with our design decisions. They help us with our spending decisions. They help us with uh, uh, sort of calling us to account for problems of, of cost. Some of those they, they uh, impose upon us by requiring that we do certain things and then wonder later why we did that and ended up costing more money in the long term. Um, and uh, I, always, I always tell people, having spent 17 years with Jake up on the Hill, I feel qualified to criticize Congress and, uh, and say they've got very, very short memories. And, uh, and the, whole, the history of the space station is, in very large part, a history of how that memory lapse caused uh, problems to extend the evolution of, of the space station, which resulted in more cost, causing more controversy. You had the annual attempts to, to uh, the attempted murder of the space station beginning in 91, 92. Um, that's the thing, maybe in Q&A we can talk about that, that I really want to stress is critical. We learned things in that 94, 93 to, to uh, 1998 period about how to deal with that reality of the Congress that are essential to anything we do in the future. Uh, we set up a war room concept. I want, I'd like to talk about that at some point if we have cute questions. Uh, if not, uh, you just have to wait for the book for that too. So, uh, but, the, the, but there's a lot there that you need to learn about how do you make, get Congress as a partner, keep them happy. They've got a, a legitimate constitutional responsibility vis-a-vis uh, -vis the administration. Um, there are ways to do that. And uh, you know, it's not, not giving you lobbying 101 but it's reality 101. And, um, and those, are, those are some of the details that we could come back to. Um, we're gonna go, uh, we're gonna complete the space station. It's gonna contribute to our knowledge and understanding of what it takes to go uh, to Mars. Uh, it's gonna play a role. It's, it's, it's basically gonna be the role we started outlining for it back in 1959, which I think is uh, quite interesting. And, um, and with that, I guess I'll just wrap up and, and, and stay tuned for questions. And, uh, but again, my, my bottom line is that this, these are not just engineering challenges. These are political challenges. These are budgetary challenges. All of that has to come into the mix for us to do anything in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Jeff. At this point, I'd like to bring Howard McCurdy up. He is uh, going to talk to us. I'll see if I can get your slides, Howard. Help me out, Roger. Yeah. Passed. Yeah. Passed. Yeah, space imperatives. Oh, Roger. Very nice. Yeah, don't you love it while this works? Yeah. It's great. Has anybody seen the. Edward Tufte uh, complaint about PowerPoint. Go out to the web and take a look at it. They have put up in PowerPoint the Gettysburg Address. <laughs> it suffers. All right. <laughs> I want to stress the importance of 1970 in the development of civil space policy. 
Uh, that's a quote from Richard Nixon there rejecting the report of the Space Task Group. What did the Space Task Group say? They said, let's build a shuttle, let's build a space station, do it simultaneously, set up a lunar base, go on to Mars, do it all by 1986. Nixon said, no, you're going to have one new initiative. And since 1970, NASA has not had a long-range plan of the Apollo type. And that's had a tremendous influence on space station. I'll also suggest very briefly that it's had a great influence on space shuttle. So what happened? Well, first of all, let me define what is uh, an incremental space policy. An incremental space policy means you proceed with small gradual steps. You do one thing, you finish it, you go to the next logical step. It's guided by a general vision, but not by a long-range objective. The definition of a good policy is simply that people agree that it's a good policy without reference to long-range goals, often for very divergent reasons. And also, what you'll find in an in incremental policy is that those policies tend to have multiple objectives. Because nobody can agree on a long-range plan. In order to get a project like Space Station approved, it has to have so many objectives that everybody who's necessary for the political coalition to get it approved is inside the tent. So let's take a look at a couple of the proposals that have been made for space stations. 1952, the United States had no long-range plan for the conquest of space. We could use that term back then. And Werner von Braun proposed a multifunctional space station, which had lots of functions that aren't even on the one that we have today. For example, it was going to be our global positioning system for uh, navigation, and it was also going to drop atom bombs on our enemies if it was approved by the Congress of the United States. By the way, he accurately estimated the cost uh, back then. It's kind of interesting. Now, go forward to 1968 when Stanley Kubrick and Arthur Clarke bring out the famous movie 2001 A Space Odyssey. What are we doing in 1968? Getting ready to circumnavigate the moon. And as a result, this big 900-foot rotating space station has a very focused objective. That is, it's a staging point for getting to the lunar base. In fact, the rotation of the space station is such that it prepares you to go to the moon because it's equal to one-sixth of the Earth's gravity. So there have, thereby you have a focused space station. When the space shuttle, shuttle started to fly in 1981, NASA officials at the field centers proposed a number of space station concepts because the idea was once the shuttle test program was over, you could move, to use Jim Beggs' words, to the next logical step in the long-range plan, which hadn't been approved. And that, of course, was an Earth-orbiting space station. So people at the Johnson Space Center, Clark Covington, for example, proposed what was called a Space Operations Center, basically a way to get to geosynchronous orbit. It's very focused. And Jim Begg said, no, you can't have that. It's too focused. So the people at Marshall Space Flight Center said, well, what about a space platform? This is the more evolved version of the space platform. But what it started out as was simply an electrical power generating capability with a pallet for scientific experiments. And then maybe later you could put some people on board in those little things that look like oil cans. And NASA headquarters, now the Space Station Task Force, under John Hodge, rejected that. That's too narrow. Now we've got to have, it's like Goldilocks not too big. It's got, to, it's got to be large enough to put together a political coalition that can get approval in the absence of a long-range plan. So here are the specifications for the space station as approved in 1983 and 1984, which became Space Station Freedom. All of those things, make sure you get down to the bottom of the list because those are very considerable constraints. It's supposed to cost $8 billion. We'll give you 12, okay? Eight to $12 billion, and it's going to be done in 10 years, and it's going to have all of these capabilities on board, which, by the way, are technically incompatible. So here's the design in 1985, a multifunctional space station. And if you, you want to trace space station history, look for the hangar in the upper center part of this diagram, you'll see a big box. That's the hangar that was going to hold satellites as they were being repaired and in some cases prepared for orbits in low Earth orbit and also in geosynchronous orbit. The dual keels disappear, 
the <laughs> space hangar disappears, many of the functions of the space station disappear, and why do they disappear? For two reasons. One, it doesn't cost eight to twelve billion dollars, it's up to fourteen point five and growing, and second, it's technically impossible to build. You can't have a microgravity research facility while people are out there banging on satellites and getting them ready to go into orbit. So it was technically incompatible, impossibly to build, the astronauts didn't like it, there was one report that they have to paint it every three years, which involves some extensive <laughs> spacewalks. So in, in creating this multifunctional space station, NASA created what was in essence eight years of redesign efforts, which, oh, by the way, cost the eight billion dollars that was originally estimated for the whole cost of developing the space station. Now, just to not throw the, all of this on the hands of the people who are doing space station, this basically is how we did the space shuttle as well. You've heard of at least two of the functions of the space shuttle, deliver military reconnaissance satellites, they're 60 feet long, deliver space station modules with the nodes, they're 60 feet long, and all sorts of other things like being a space truck, transport civilians, fly 24 to 50 times per year, cost only $5.15 billion for startup costs, reduce the cost of mission operations by a factor of 10, and what does that give you? It gives you the Columbia. And the Columbia Accident Investigation Board traces one of the causes, one of the underlying causes of the accident back to the increased design, increased complexity of a shuttle that was designed to be all things to all people. Why did it have to be all things to all people? Well, that's how you got it approved after Nixon had rejected the long-range plan. There was no long-range objective against which these functions could be judged. And so, in order to get it approved, it had to have multiple functions, multiple objectives, but that made it much more technically difficult to implement. What would a space station have looked like had Nixon approved the 1970 long-range plan? Well, that's a very interesting question, and I don't know. I'm just a historian. I can only tell you what happened. I can't tell you what would have happened if the South had won the Civil War or any of those other speculations. But it is suggested, going back to the history of Project Apollo, that you would have had a much more focused space program. Remember back to the mode decision in Project Apollo. There was Werner von Braun, always a great proponent of a space station, or at least assembly in space, who wanted to do Earth orbit rendezvous. He also had a great big thing called a Nova rocket that he thought might be possible to propel astronauts to the moon using a technique called direct descent. The folks at the Johnson Space Center were interested in part in direct descent, and then a small group at the Langley Research Center said, what about lunar orbit rendezvous? And everybody thought they were nuts, that it couldn't be done in the 1962 time frame. But in fact, it turns out to be the most technically efficient way to go. And why was that chosen? Well, there's a famous line from the meeting in which Werner von Braun backed down from his Earth assembly approach. And somebody simply said to Werner von Braun and the other people at the meeting, do we want to go to the moon or not? And that just stopped the discussion because everybody wanted to go to the moon. And that focus provided a means for deciding how to go. If somebody had said, we need a space station because we want to figure out how we can make people live on the moon for six months to three years without resupply as a test bed for going to Mars, we would have had a different space station. Might have had one with artificial gravity. It's hard to say. But we never had that discussion for space station or for space shuttle in the same way that we had it for Project Apollo. So it's a very interesting question. The choices in front of us right now are very clear. We've come to a uh, rare alignment of the planets or of the stars. It's a point in time in which the White House could actually make a long-term space policy pronouncement. Why is there a re rare alignment of the planets? Well. Uh, in part because it's a midterm presidential election year and the last two major human spaceflight initiatives have occurred in midterm presidential election years. We might also note that California was in play in both of those elections, 1972 and 1984, and uh, California was not in play until the recall, so I've always suggested that uh, should a long-term space policy be approved that it be called the Arnold Schwarzenegger space policy. 
at any rate, there's a number of factors, including the Columbia accident, that have put pressure on the White House to possibly come up with a long-range space plan. And if that does occur, it would provide purpose for a large number of decisions, including the replacement for the shuttle, for the purpose of the space station as it evolves, and alternatives could be weighed against purpose. But history doesn't always turn out the way you want it to. We could continue for another 33 years with an unfocused program, small incremental steps, multiple and conflicting objectives, difficult to implement, lots of time and probably a good deal away. So those are the decisions that are before us right now. I think we can learn a lot from history to anticipate the future. Thanks very much. We're done, right? Yeah, I'll just take it off. No, we're take what out? Uh, I'll get it off. Just leave it up for a second. Thank you, Howard. Uh, at this point in time, I'd like to bring up Neil Tyson. Uh, Neil is from the Hayden Planetarium in New York City. He is one of the uh, best known and uh, uh, and most uh, media savvy of all the astrophysicists that are out there. Uh, he is uh, important as a public intellectual in issues of space flight, and that's a very significant arena to be in. At this point, Neil? Thank you. I, I didn't alert the media guy that I'm going to plug a new computer into this. I, I assume it's okay with him. He's nodding. Okay. I just yanked the, yank your plugs off of here. <laughs> you don't have a problem. <laughs> She's running fast up to the front of the room. <laughs> yeah, thanks. While we do our technology transfer, uh, let me just comment that uh, I am, to the extent that I'm his, an historian at all, it comes about simply because I've just thought a lot about what has enabled cultures in the past to undertake major expensive funded projects. So I've done a fair amount of work trying to come to terms with that, trying to understand what it means if we say today or next week or in a couple of weeks, let's go to Mars in the same way that that announcement was made in 1961. And we'll come up in a second. There we go. I think I'm cool. Let's see. See if that works. Hang on. Turn on mirroring. Looking good. Okay. So I just want to spend a couple of minutes with you discussing funding drivers, the history of funding drivers for doing major funded projects. And what I'm about to present, I don't like to, I don't think of it as an opinion. Maybe you will, but I don't think of it as opinion. I think of it as a reading of history that can tell us a whole lot about what the next steps will be that we might take. Uh, first, let me just this is I, I work here. Uh, <laughs> there are museums outside of Washington, D.C. This one is in New York City, the American Museum of Natural History, and, and my office overlooks that sphere uh, right there. And I, I show you this only because it's a major new facility that brought a new flux of people through and enables me to get first-hand exposure to people's feelings and attitudes about space, about science in general. And a couple of little factoids, I want to uh, lay some landscape here with you. We get about two million annual visitors to the Hayden Planetarium and the, what is now in this complex, the Rose Center for Earth and Space. And another little tidbit, I don't know if you can see from down in the corner here, but uh, we host two major panels a year, not unlike this a panel. Uh, one of them is on the frontier of astrophysics annually, and that draws more than a thousand people. It's always standing room only, and we have spillover into an adjacent room. Using exactly the same marketing strategies and publication uh, and, and, and publicity channels, we have another panel on space exploration. In this context, it refers primarily to the hardware of getting into space, propulsion, uh, space station, that sort of things. Try to get an astronaut in on that. And it never draws as much 
as the frontier of astrophysics. And on a good day, we might get 300 people compared with upwards of 1,200 for the other. And I submit that as much as we in this room would all like to believe that the space exploration one is high, we learned earlier that, of course, if you actually took a poll from any time between 1961 and today, most of the public has actually a diminished interest in space exploration, which is hard for so many of us to believe, but is in fact true. But not only that, it may be, I'm making this up now, it may be that we are deluged positively with advances on the frontier of astrophysics. Every next Hubble mission that produces another image of a black hole in the center of a galaxy, that's headlines on Time Magazine or Newsweek. And whereas there's not much to boast about in the second category, to get put a flame under people's rear ends and get them to participate and to attend panels. Well, let me just give you these per perspectives. It's, I've got a couple of minutes here. Let's just do that. Uh, let's lay some groundwork first. Uh, we heard uh, Dr. Toffler this morning uh, praise for his precision. Uh, there are a lot of famous quotes out there that are famous for their imprecision. Uh, let me lead off with one. December 30th, 1900, coming off the, uh, ce celebrating the triumphs of the railroad and the automobile, and this is an editorial in the Brooklyn Daily Eagle. It is scarcely possible that the 20th century will witness improvements in transportation that will be as great as those were in the 19th. Now, that's a completely visionless quote, but uttered back then was entirely believable. They had sent steamships into the North Atlantic. They did all the things that had never been done before. People were riding high. Here's one, man will not fly for 50 years. That's okay, except it was uttered by Wilbur Wright in 1901. That's kind of embarrassing. Uh, here's one, not the first time, and it was not the last time that the New York Times had egg on their face. Here they are ragging on Professor Langley. We hope that he will not put his substantial greatness as a scientist in further peril by continuing to waste his time and the money involved in further airship experiments. Life is short. He's capable of services to humanity of incomparably greater than can be expected to result from him trying to learn how to fly. Uh, for students and investigators of the Langley type, there are more useful experiments. New York Times, December 10th, 1903, one week before Wilbur. That's just embarrassing for the New York Times, I'm sorry. Um, excuse me, could you up the volume of the microphone a little more? Because I'll otherwise lose my voice, and I'll just, I'll, I'll pull back on it. Thank you. I prefer that. Uh, here we go. No, now, now they, they fly now, all right? So what does Orville say? Well, no flying machine will ever fly from New York to Paris, 1908. That's just embarrassing, all right? And here's one of my brethren, an astronomer from the University of Chicago, 1932. No hope for the fanciful idea of reaching the moon because of insurmountable barriers to escape Earth's gravity. I'm embarrassed for my community that one of us made that comment. Now, there's a point to this. This is not just fun time with old quotes. There's a, we're actually going somewhere with this. We'll move forward in time. 1948, Science Digest. Landing and moving around on the moon offers so many serious problems that it may take science another two hundred years to lick them. 1948. 1957, the last of the visionless quotes that could not imagine a future. Man will never reach the moon, regardless of all future scientific advances. Radio pioneer Lee DeForest, February 25th, 1957. Before Sputnik, of course. Sputnik gets launched. The Apollo program gets announced, people get riled about going into space. Now they begin to overpredict. 1966, Wall Street Journal, the most ambitious United States space endeavor in the years ahead will be to campaign to land men on Mars. Most experts estimate this will be accomplished by 1985. 1967, the futurist, a manned lunar base will be in existence by 1986. Here's my favorite, Robert Troll, rocket scientist. By the year 2000, 50,000 people will be living and working in space. I looked up in the year 2000, there were three. Three, was that right? Three in, in the year 2000, three people. And late in the year, okay, not even January 1st. Uh, my point here is, 
What happened? What happened there was there was a, a whitewashing of the actual history of events. You know, there are two kinds of failure of memory. One of them is you remember things that never happened. The other one is you forgot things that did happen. Now, when you look at the depth of emotion that people bring to bear on our effort to go into space, and the baggage and the, the, the dreams they bring to it, it's easy to understand how memories can just be completely confounded based on your own template of the past. So let's go back in time and find out why they all got this wrong. What I did some years back for a volume called The Columbia History of the 20th Century, I contributed a chapter called Paths to Discovery. And it's that effort that had me realize, maybe it's obvious to some historians in the room, it was not obvious to me. I went back and I said, give me a list of all the most expensive projects ever undertaken by cultures across the world and through time. And I made a list and I showed it to some friends and we all agreed that those things belonged on the list. And we would agree of what is on the, like you put the Great Wall of China, expensive project, expensive in human capital and as a percent of a gross domestic product. That's what I mean by expensive. The Great Wall of China, the Manhattan Project, the Columbus voyages, any of those big voyages of the day, the Magellan voyages as well, the pyramids, cathedral building in Europe, we don't, we'd agree that these are some of the most expensive things ever conducted. So I said, well, if we want to do an expensive thing in the future, I better find out how it, is, how it was that these expensive things came about. So I did that little bit of homework, and I found out that there are only three drivers, three drivers of expensive things in the history of time. The number one driver, obvious to us all in this room, is war or defense. If your survival is at stake, you will spend any amount of money it takes. Number one driver for major funded project. Number two driver, the promise of economic return. Everybody wants to get rich. You always have money when there's the potential of getting rich. And there's a third driver which is harder to come by today because we don't live in the era of powerful kings, but it's the driver that is the praise of power, praise of deity, praise of royalty. That's how you get, for example, the pyramids of Egypt, the cathedral buildings of Europe. So I made a list and they split into three categories. Nowhere in these categories is exploration the driver. Yes, it's true that Christopher Columbus was an explorer, but somebody had to write the check, and the check was not written by an Italian. That's how expensive that check was. They said, go take a hike. So he goes to Queen Isabella, she writes the check, and because of that, most of South America speaks Spanish and not Italian today. She understood the power and the economics of that investment, even if Italy did not. And you got other things here. So my point is, on the Apollo project, we all know it's a defense project, made clear in panelists before me. It's a defense project. I'll say more about that in just a second. So I found only three things, defense, economic return, praise of power. So all the discussion, so these, these, these futurists of my list of visionless quotes, who saw us go to the moon, they presumed that that was in, that when it happened was its own inevitable step for humanity, for other steps are sure to follow. And those statements are completely missing the geopolitical factors that got us to the moon in the first place. They just think it was just a nice idea. It was war, war. I served on the uh, President's Aerospace Commission, right along with Buzz Aldrin. We were the two sort of space people of the 12. The other 10 were sort of airplane people. 
Part of that uh, year and a half study, we went around the world to look at the climate in which American aerospace has to function, what the competition is. One of our trips was to Beijing. I expected to see streets of bicycles based on all the pictures I had seen. Nope. Mercedes-Benz, Audis, Volkswagens, 10 cars for every bicycle, not 10 bicycles for every car. That's happened just the last couple of years. I go to the Great Wall of China, kind of like a pilgrimage, because this is on my list of major funded projects ever undertaken. Look, it just goes on and on and on and on and on. And I show you this picture because I just had to do it. You ready? You ready? I made a cell phone call to my mother in Westchester, New York. And that connection was clearer than any cell phone connection I have ever had between Washington and New York. At that point, I knew this is a sleeping giant. In fact, they're not sleeping, they're awake. They're awake, and they understand technology at the point made just before a few minutes earlier. They understand, and they know where it's going. They know the value of it. So that when they finally announce they're going to go around the Earth and put a man on the moon, I'm surprised it hasn't already happened, given what the rate of the growth of that technology that I saw. So because of this awareness that it's never discovery that gets you places, even if the person at the helm is himself or herself a discoverer, the person that writes the check is a completely different incentive. When we prepared our recommendation in the Aerospace Commission report in the space chapter, there's more detail in the full chapter, by the way, but we don't actually list discovery first. That would be a lie. That would be a misrepresentation of how you actually get this stuff done. And so we explore the fact that, in fact, maybe an active space program is good for security. Maybe so. And I'll tell you how in a moment. But here we go. We talk about uh, part innovative, blah, 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 especially in the areas of propulsion and power, will enhance our national security, major spin-offs to our economy, accelerate exploration, the near and distant universe. That's third here. That's a, that's a byproduct of the fact that somebody writes the check. Now, how does security come into this? Well, uh, you know, in wartime, while it may be bravery that wins the battle, the history of war sh shows us that it's science and technology that wins the war in nearly every case. Yes, there's some blunders in the past and some exceptions, but they're just exceptions to this broad-based rule. Look what happened in the Manhattan Project, a major funded project that we as Americans remember as an American project. It's Americans because we funded it, but look at who actually did it. All right, now I have Einstein on this list, but of course he was not an active participant, but his science mattered in building the bomb. Hans Bethe, Niels Bohr, Enrico Fermi, Arthur Compton, Otto Hahn, Lise Meitner, Oppenheimer. You know, the list, you know, there's six Nobel laureates among this list. They were all active in the Manhattan Project. Where were they born? Germany, Denmark, Germany, Italy, USA. Germany, Austria, USA. Germany, Italy, Hungary, Hungary. We got two native-borns there. Where did they get their PhDs? Munich, Copenhagen, Zurich, Pisa. Only one got their PhD in America. Arthur Compton from Princeton. Munich, Vienna, Göttingen. Berlin, Rome, Berlin, and Göttingen again. So, this, is, this worries me. Because, yes, it's true, these were scientists actually engaged in curiosity-driven research on the atom. Basically minding their own business. And then, the government tapped them on the shoulder and said, we need you. We have an emergency. And so they came to the call. So in a way, this strategy was not, well, how many bombs are in your silo? It is, what is the intellectual capital that you have stored up in your silo? We were fortunate that they were all on our side because we could not have done the Manhattan Project on American intellectual capital. It's not how our education system was forged. It's not that way today, barely. That worries me deeply. But what I know is that it's the science that won the war in each one of these cases. Radar, breaking the German code. Oh, 
Who was responsible for landing men on the moon? America, but of course it was Werner von Braun, born somewhere else, with a PhD from somewhere else. So I submit to you that this quote, which to this day still raises hair on the back of my neck, because we can all hear, we can hear even the vocal inflections of President Kennedy just as we read this quote to ourselves. That's how famous this quote is. And we say, oh, we were discoverers. But we forget that this same speech given to the joint session of Congress on May 25th, just a month or so after Yuri Gagarin had come out of orbit, this is actually not what got us to the moon. We like to think it is. We like to think back then they had leaders and visionaries, something that we're missing today. I'm sorry. That's not what the record shows. Let's go earlier in the speech to another paragraph that is never retold. If we are to win the battle that is now going on around the world between freedom and tyranny, the dramatic achievements in space, which occurred in recent weeks, should have made clear to us all, as did Sputnik, the impact of this adventure on the minds of men everywhere who are attempting to make a determination of which road they should take. This is a battle cry against communism. It is nothing more than that. And he happens to layer some discovery talk on this, okay? That, and this is, this is what resonates, but that's what wrote the check. And you go to NASA in Florida, you can't see this, but it's a bust of Kennedy at Kennedy Space Center. And off to the side is the exploration paragraph, not the tyranny paragraph. Again, that's part of the cleaning up of why we actually went there in the first place. So, I have only two more slides. Thanks for bearing with me on this. I'd, what's my message? My message is there's no obvious economic incentive to go to the moon or Mars right now. There's no obvious military incentive to go to the moon or Mars right now, unless China announces they want to build military bases on, the, on Mars. Hell, we'll be in Mars in a year. For sure, you know that. Um, there's, an, there's a curious even uh, PR angle on that because, because Mars is already red, you know, so you can like market that one very well. Um, but surely if they made such an announcement, that would be a Sputnik-like moment relived in modern times. So I, I tried to grope for what, going forward, we have major security problems domestic homeland security. There's, uh, there seems to always be a war going on somewhere around the world. We don't feel like our entire nation is at threat, but specifically pockets of it, bioterrorism, chemical warfare, all these factors. You know, what I want for that, I don't want brave soldiers. I want the intellectual capital of the frontier of chemistry, biology, and physics as my front line. Because I know if we train them for that, they'll come. Now, how do you train them for that? You don't say, okay, why don't you come up and be an aerospace engineer so that you can build an airplane that's 10% faster than the one your parents flew. No, you say, be an engineer, be a biologist, be this, because we're gonna look for life on Mars. We're gonna look at the chemistry of the center of the moon. We're gonna dig for water on Europa. There's the dream. That'll get the next generation of scientists. They're not gonna come up just because you tell them they ought to do it. They're gonna come up because there's a plan a plan that they can attach their dreams on. And when I stand in front of eighth graders and I want to get them excited, that'll give me something to tell them. And once you have that, and once you're trying to grow crops on Mars in the high iron, low oxygen, low atmospheric pressure, as an example, I'm making this up, but that's as an example, and you need, and we ought to combat bioterrorism, where, where is my frontline biologist going to be drawn from? They're going to be drawn from the biologist who are working on Mars and the research that came out from that. that that's, it's the scientists in the silo model, not the bombs in the silo. It's going to be hard to convince people that going into space is a defense project. It might even be impossible. So this is my last slide. So I, I don't know if it'll work. But I do know that there are more planets in alignment today than in recent memory, than in perhaps 40, 30 years. And I just made a list of it. In our report, the Aerospace Commission report, we uh, offered strong bipartisan support 
for space initiatives. Project Prometheus had been around but got reannounced in February uh, under NASA for a new propulsion. Uh, the Columbia tragedy. What matters there is that the bereaved families stood there and said, this must continue. They didn't say this must stop. This must continue. China puts a man in space, the 40th anniversary of the Kennedy assassination. You can't do that without re-reciting his mantra. The centennial of flight yesterday, two Mars, NASA Mars landings happening in a couple of weeks. That's going to be headlines everywhere. You know it. President State of the Union, he's going to want to say something big. Multiple congressional hearings. Many people in this room testified about our future in space at recent hearings. Multiple workshops such as this. Um, ongoing debates and, and, and in the court of op-eds. Space has not been shy from appearing in newspapers at a level never before seen. I don't think I've seen it at the rate today as, as, as it ever been. And of course, we need something that we can feel proud about. But I can tell you this, we have unprecedented support. And I see it firsthand at media coverage of cosmic discovery. And you know that whatever our space initiative will do, it's a slight overcost on that to get all the kind of cosmic discovery we would need to excite the next generation. And so my reading of history tells me it's still possible, but it'll take kind of like a re-education of what our mission plan will be. And that re-education can't be, let's do it because it's there. It won't be, let's do it because it's our destiny, because major funded projects have to be funded across economic cycles and across political cycles. And that's why, without those three drivers, other ones just fail. Because it doesn't work if they're on an unemployment line and they say, how do you feel about, well, we're bounding around on the surface of Mars, how do you feel about, well, I can't feed my kids. That makes bad newspaper copy unless there's some other kind of return that's tangible and not just discovery. Thank you, I, I overstood my welcome, thank you. Thank you, Neil. I, uh, I know everyone that we're a little bit over our schedule. I'm going to take uh, some time and invite up Owen Garriott to, uh, to close our presentation today. Owen was a Skylab astronaut. He is a very thoughtful and reflective individual and the appropriate person to uh, kind of wrap this up. And then we'll have some time right at the end. We'll take about uh, three or four minutes and have a few questions. And of course, the panelists will be here to talk to you later. I don't need that at all. Well, uh, Roger, you've given me quite a task here. Not only I am the last speaker of the, of the uh, program here, but which is normally not an attractive spot, but I get to follow a fellow like Neil. I mean, a, the dynamic speaker like that gives me almost no uh, chance at all uh, to make not a significant right. impression. So what I want to really talk a few minutes about only is our space program uh, and its past as a prologue, as we discussed last night. What can we learn from the past that might help guide us a little bit uh, into the future? Uh, Buzz uh, talked very early this morning about a, a consensus being developed. Uh, when you look in the dictionary for what consensus means, it's not entirely clear whether they're talking about 51% or nearby, or 99% or nearby. And if we want to talk about a consensus near 99%, I think it's almost hopeless. That's more than we can expect. Now, of course, we are the right kind of group to decide to. Uh, make the best formulation of what space policy ought to be. Uh, scientists, technologists, engineers, we probably know the best answers. But on the other hand, as so many of our speakers have already mentioned this morning, we only make the recommendation. The decision is ultimately made by people from a consideration of the economic and political aspects. People with business degrees, legal de law degrees, evaluating the alternatives that we provide them. And so even though we come close to a consensus between 51 and 99 percent, that's not necessarily going to be the final decision made along those as much as we would like it to be. Uh, one thing we can look at and should look at according to our uh, task here provided to us is to look at some alternatives. What alternatives have been provided to us in past years and what decisions did we make? And uh, were they the right ones or not and what should it, how should it guide us in the future? Well, of course, my uh, original exposure to uh, space as a, as a uh, participant was on the Skylab program uh, almost uh, 30 years ago exactly. We had our 30th anniversary uh, reunion uh, just last month in Huntsville, Alabama. 
uh, a fine uh, time uh, there, or perhaps a research laboratory is the appropriate uh, kind of a name for either the ISS, uh, the current one, or the Skylab in those days. Uh, but uh, uh, just to take a few moments to remind you, since it hasn't been mentioned yet this morning, Skylab did have a lot of problems right at the beginning, but they, uh, the period between April 14, when the Skylab uh, was launched uh, from the Cape, and April 25, when the first crew was launched, I consider to be the finest 10 or 11 days of NASA's entire uh, lifetime. Now, Apollo 13 was a comparable kind of a thing, but it was basically focused on the controllers at JSC and a, a handful of the crewmen who decided what the best alternatives were for rescuing those people in a very precarious situation, done successfully, had the attraction of the entire world, actually, uh, following those uh, a brief interval on, on Apollo 13. Now, on Skylab, we had so many problems, it was thought very likely that the whole Skylab program would have been lost on April 14. As uh, the vehicle was launched into space, the micrometeoroid shield was torn away. It caused the internal temperatures to go uh, quite high, 130, 140 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, only half of the solar power was available, that from the, uh, the array of telescopes called Apollo Telescope Mount. That worked fine, but the two arrays on the workshop, one was torn away, dropped in the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. The second was pinned down by a strap. All of this had to be understood from a very modest amount of telemetry on board. And then in those next 10 days, they had to understand the problem, what kind of fixes could be made, build those fixes, test those fixes, put them within the command module, which was already fully loaded, they thought, prior to the next launch, and launch it on May the 25th. All of that was done successfully, and I consider those 11 days the finest hours finest days that NASA has ever experienced, not only among the civil servants, but the 100,000 or so contractors all around the country, all of the centers working together in a, a cohesive fashion, far better than I have seen, for example, JSC and Marshall work together as tight as a glove uh, in ways that I have not seen in the next 30 years. Not just my opinion, that's the majority opinion, I believe, on both uh, JSC, Marshall, and other NASA centers around the world. It, that teamwork activity is a very important lesson, that if we can figure out that formula, if we can find out how to do that and maintain that enthusiasm and the ability to work together, there's no telling what our efficiency uh, might uh, eventually uh, turn into. Um, it was basically repaired by the first crew that went up there. They managed to, uh, to re remove that binding strap, which held down the one solar array mechanically, had to physically actually, uh, Pete Conrad, Joe Kerwin, to raise that uh, panel up to where the power was brought up to an adequate amount to sustain all three of the manned flights that followed thereafter, and uh, was, became a very successful program, as I, I'm not going into more of the history on that. One, I think, rather important thing, that every mission, of which there were three, was a new world record in terms of uh, flight endurance. Uh, 28 days on the first flight uh, was more than 50% larger than it had ever been flown before. Second flight doubled that to almost 60 days, and the third flight to almost a 50% number again. And so that was only one of the kinds of activities, but the experience of flying longer in space than it had ever been flown before was one of the significant accomplishments. Now, there were a number of other things learned in the process of that. For example, weightlessness some more precisely free fall, sometimes called zero G, but all of those things. Uh, prior to Skylab, you were never really sure whether people could live and work well in this kind of a weightlessness environment. Skylab, I think, put all that to rest. However, not necessarily. Uh, we were talking about consensus a while ago. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, there's never a consensus, even on now, uh, whether weightlessness is a satisfactory environment for people uh, to live and work for a long duration. We're still looking at spinning or rotating artificial gravity in order to go to Mars. Uh, Skylab uh, went to three months. Uh, the the uh, uh, Mike Fold in space as, as we speak has just, in, uh, I believe, passed the endurance record for Americans in space of something like 280 days or so intermittent uh, space flights. And uh, the continuous space flight record is uh, Dr. Polyakov uh, still working well in Moscow. No one has had any serious problems with that. Either radiation, uh, mineral loss, any other activities, all crew members have come back and readapted to a to, uh, normal gravitational environment over the course of the next few weeks. But yet we're still debating on whether or not we ought to be in a weightlessness environment. My own view is, 
There's nothing wrong with a spinning rotation, except we've never tried that. We've never uh, run experiments with people in an artificial gravity environment and then seen what uh, the Coriolis forces and the adaptations associated that, with that might be. We've never had to come back to Earth to see if there's any difference in readaptation to Earth. We have in weightlessness, and so we ought to keep that in mind in uh, uh, how we plan for future activities. Now, um, um, there are a number of other kinds of lessons that uh, could very well or should have been learned from uh, some of these uh, earlier flights. Uh, I, I mentioned uh, the, the fact that I think Skylab was done just right. There was a couple, uh, Bob mentioned uh, earlier, the possibility of flying in what was called the wet workshop to begin with. Now, I'll not go into the story of that, where the crew was going to have to passivate a stage which had been filled with liquid hydrogen before they could fit it out as a manned laboratory. It was done properly with Skylab. And so the third stage of the Saturn V was already fitted out as a laboratory Almost everything was put into it, and when there was a problem with the launch, the crews went up to do the things that were off nominal. They re made repairs to the things that the, the, the solar arrays that had been strapped down, etc. That, I think, is the appropriate way you know, to, uh, to launch large masses into Earth orbit. Well, to me, that's one of the most important lessons that came out of Skylab. Of course, for a variety of reasons, we decided to go a different path when it came to uh, the uh, orbiter and the construction of the space station. And uh, we talked about uh, uh, alternatives and uh, consensus again. Uh, just last night, for example, uh, Bob, uh, Hans Mark, Bob's wife Dot and I were uh, discussing uh, at the celebration last night at the gala, and it became so uh, heated, as a matter of fact, uh, his wife Dot says, are you fellows friends? We had to agree, yes, we were. So I think she was about to send us back to our room for a quiet time. Uh, we were becoming somewhat obstreperous, I think. I'm but the, the yeah, I, I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> but at any rate, there's a lots of difference of opinion. Even when the facts, as we all know them and work through them together, are well known, our interpretation of those facts is going to make it difficult to re reach a consensus of uh, 51 to 99 percent on where we ought to uh, go in the future. And weightlessness is one of those things. But the, one of the most important ones is the use of a heavy lift vehicle to put up a large part of the station uh, or future uh, trips into uh, the, the solar system in a single launch. My own view, if we could go back, and I must agree that I did not have to make those decisions with respect to the economics and the politics when we were planning how to do the station, we should not have put it up in chunks of 10 to 20 tons at a time, when with a heavy lift vehicle, we could have had a different design, still modular, but not in little modules, but instead putting up a, a, a workable space station in one or two launches, and we would have already had a working space station, in my view, if we'd have made that decision along back at about 1985. Well, that's not a consensus. We don't, we don't have a, certainly not a 99% consensus on that point, but those are the kinds of things we need to be considering when, after we complete the station with the orbiter, what do we want to do next in terms of the exploration of the solar system? So the heavy lift vehicle, I think, is another very important parameter that we uh, need to take a look at. So there are still other issues which we can learn from the past uh, as a, a prologue for the future. We know that there are problems if we're going to go to Mars, potentially with radiation. I don't think there are significant problems with, in, in terms of mineral loss. Uh, we, uh, we, I think, know how or are learning how uh, to get around those. But uh, we should not forget those kinds of lessons that we uh, have uh, been able to uh, learn from the past and be very careful how we evaluate and interpret uh, our plans for future activities based upon those past records. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Owen. We're going to take about uh, three to four, maybe as much as five minutes for questions, and I'm sure you've got them out in the audience. So raise your hand. Uh, there's a gentleman with a microphone here. I see a, a, a gentleman right over here. One of the things that's made the space station, shall I say, more interesting has been the international involvement. And yet I have, one of the things that's made the space station more interesting uh, has been the international involvement. And when I hear about things like going back to the moon or to Mars, people talk about an international project. But nobody has mentioned anything about the internationals. Uh, is there any comment from the panel in that area? Jeff, go ahead. Yeah, it's on my last page. I just had to cut it short. <laughs> Thanks, Bo. Uh, that's a uh... Good question, and the station, of course, is, a, is the epitome of, of our recent experience in international participation. 
you know, not only is anything that we're going to do going to be uh, expensive, it's going to be, it's going to have to be international. I don't think anybody doubts that if we're going to go launch a major program, we can't do it as a single country. I don't think anybody believes that anymore, if they ever did. Um, so, and the thing about Space Station is uh, that experience has been incredibly valuable because we had a situation where NASA had basically been handed a foreign policy objective in 1993 when the Russians especially were brought into the program, but even more so back in the beginning in 84 when Reagan established, made the decision. It was an international program then. Uh, we've had varying levels of, of support from the State Department, people are supposed to handle foreign relations, and particularly with the uh, ISS, NASA became a mini State Department. And uh, that experience of negotiating with our partners has been extremely valuable, and so it's a good precursor, but that's a good point. I just didn't get to it on my head when I had to cut short, or I would have mentioned it. Thanks. Let me, is this mic on? Yeah, Bob. Uh, at the risk of, uh, you know, throwing a pebble in the water here, I think international participation has a lot of pluses. But you have to also recognize the negatives that are there. And you've got to be prepared to deal with them, and you've got to be realistic. The complication of a bureaucratic nature is very significant. The funding has to be understood. A uh, fairly interesting comment I would make, I think it's accurate, when we started working with the Russians on space station, we had already had very much in development a propulsion module in this country, an attitude control and propulsion module that had been through hot fire. As part of our joining up with the Russians, it was going to save us money to destroy ours and let them provide one. Quicker, cheaper, better. Congress says, well, how are we sure that the Russians are going to provide it? So let us go study it. We studied it and said, we know how we'll make them provide it. We'll pay for it. <laughs> Think about that. Okay. In the back, yes. Okay. Robert Super. Um Howard McCurdy um, made a case that the difference between the level of accomplishment to the Apollo era and the post-Apollo era was based upon the fact that then they had a destination-driven program uh, that provided purpose against which uh, steps could be measured as compared to uh, since then when you have not had that. Uh, Neil Tyson has said that the reason why we're not doing comparable accomplishments to Apollo is because we don't have the same kind of driving motivation, um, which and has created insufficient resources to do that. And I think, though, there is a, uh, a fact that is available to public scrutiny that shows that uh, McCurdy is correct and, and Dyson is, uh, Tyson is not. Um, and that is simply this, that the NASA budget today, while a lower percentage of the federal budget than the Apollo budget, is in real inflation-adjusted dollars 90 percent of the average Apollo budget between 61 and 73. The expenditures we have done on NASA between 1990 and today are equal to the expenditures in real dollars that were done in NASA between 61 and 73. In the 1990s, we flew, what, something like three score shuttle missions, okay? You have to, th those weren't cheap. The national resources are in fact there. The American people do believe in the space program, in its spiritual goal, if you wish, which is the celebration of the idea of progress, the, uh, they do to the uh, amount of providing the resources required. It is what we have been lacking is adequate leadership. Without the setting of a goal, there can be no progress. You cannot make progress with a random walk. Okay. Neil, would you like to respond to that at all? Uh, yeah. A couple of things. Uh, first, I, there's no denying the value of a goal around which everyone can rally. I think with the, uh, the important thing here is, what is the sort of the, the, the funding level that's below the radar, that be, that's below the radar? We are a wealthier nation today than we were back then, and, so, and our sort of awareness and sensitivity to technology is much vastly greater. So I would submit to you that our radar level for conducting projects is higher today than it was back then. 
All that matters is not that we have more money or equal money spent today at these decades than as the 60s, but that if we go to Mars by most projected ways, perhaps not by Bob Zubrin's way, which is on the cheap, but if for most other ways that people imagine we'll go to Mars, that's an increment above what it is we're spending today, and that's all I'm referring to. I'm not, uh, I'm not, I, I won't debate his, his valid point that these, these monies are the same. Okay. Let well, me also comment there. I think if I look at what happened in the well, first... If we can do it for the same, let's do it. Let, if you can figure out how to do it in today's budget, let's do it. I don't have a problem with that. that then that's effectively kind of under the new radar level that we've established for modern times. Sorry. A point I was trying to make is in the first one-third of manned space flight, the things that led to Apollo, the activity was well articulated at a very high and very important level in our leadership, and it was understood and supported. What we have done in our objectives in low Earth orbit was not articulated and focused, and therefore most people don't know what we've really been trying to do with the shuttle and the space station to put in low Earth orbit a laboratory and operate it for a number of years to find out these things of a medical nature, of a materials nature, of an operational nature, of the things that will be building blocks for going back to the moon or going to Mars. It has not been articulated, and that was a point I was trying to make. The president at that time did not feel that he either wanted to or could encapsulate that mission, and for 23 years we haven't understood it. Okay, thanks. We'll take one last question in the back. The gentleman that's standing. Yeah, I'm Fred Singer. I'd like to follow up uh, the point that uh, Robert Zubrin raised and that Neil Tyson answered. Uh, and I address my question to the moderator, to you, Roger. Okay. When you showed uh, the slide that uh, indicated or seemed to indicate that there was less uh, than, let's say, less than 100% enthusiasm for Mars, I'm afraid that this was based on the impression that people have that the cost of going to Mars is $450 billion. That was the uh, number that's been bandied about since Bush won. And that is number should be eliminated. Uh, I think if you repeat this poll and give a number that says we can accomplish a Mars mission within the existing NASA budget, you will get a very different answer. I absolutely think you're right about that. If you can do it within the confines of the $15 billion and change of the NASA budget, I don't think there'll be anybody that'll necessarily complain about that. Um, I mean, obviously, I didn't ask the questions, and you can frame questions on these public opinion polls in certain ways to get answers that, uh, that might be good or bad, uh, depending upon your perspective. But uh, those were the questions and the answers as they undertook them uh, in the Gallup and, and uh, Roper polls that, uh, that I cited. I think with that, we probably need to close the session. Uh, thank you for your indulgence this morning. We're sorry we've cut in significantly to the break. Uh, I'm sure we'll have a few minutes uh, to, uh, to go around. Anyway, thank you all. Roger, thank you. Gentlemen, all, thank you. Okay, here's what we're going to do. Most of your break has disappeared into thin air or space. You got 10 minutes, 10.35, we start. That's by my watch. You got eight and a half minutes. Bathrooms are down the hall that direction on the right-hand side. There's drinks, there's cookies, and uh, if we can get the next panel up here on time, we will start 10.35. Thank you.